Good morning, Southside. Uh, my name is Levi Barber. If I haven't met you, I'm one of the students here in the ministry training program. Please go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. We'll be looking specifically at verses 23 and 24 with a little bit of 22 and 25 in there as well on the front end and the back end. All right. I'll go ahead and read from 21 actually to give us some context or maybe 20, I'll do 20. So for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Oh God, may you be worshiped this morning. Father, please open our eyes. And soften our hearts. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for making yourself known. Thank you for restoring us, your creation, to yourself. God, thank you for sending your own son. Father, please use this text this morning, work through your word. May your spirit use it to take um, our trust completely off of ourselves and anything in this world and cast us completely on Christ. Father, please help us trust in Christ alone. That we may rest in you, find peace in you and rejoice in you and hope in you and give glory to you. Father, please bless our worship this morning. Please help us know your presence. May your spirit use your word to transform us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so today is the 29th of October, which means in two days there's a big holiday coming up, and it's not Halloween. Uh, it's Reformation Day. And if you're not familiar with Reformation Day, it's a celebration basically of uh, in the year 1517, so 506 years ago, a Catholic monk named Martin Luther went and nailed a, a document of 95 Thesis um, to the church door in Wittenberg. And it sounds really uh, rebellious, but actually to do that was just an, a, a fairly normal thing. He was a professor at the university, and that's how professors announced they wanted to debate somebody on an academic issue. So he was basically looking for an academic debate. And the topic was actually about the sale of indulgences within the Catholic Church, which had been particularly abused in his region of Germany. Um, there was a guy going around and his catchphrase, if you will, was, when the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Um, so the sale of indulgences in the Catholic Church was essentially, you perform certain acts or give money to the church, and you can help your loved ones or yourself later on um, make it through purgatory faster. Purgatory is when you, where you went to burn off the sin that remained in you after you died because their belief is that no one can enter heaven apart from being 
righteous in their own nature. Anyway, so, so Luther took issue with the way that a guy in his region was going around selling these indulgences and trying to coerce people into giving the Catholic Church money and by their way into heaven. So he nailed the 95 Thesis to the door and then he essentially went viral. I was reading something he said he was the first mass media event because somebody took his 95 Thesis and printed it in mass and shipped it all over Europe and became a big thing. Um, and that kicked Luther off and started to pit him against the Catholic Church, which initially he just wanted to reform and later uh, he eventually was forced to split off from. Um, and as he dug into his studies, as he battled with the Roman church, he got to the root of the issue. It was not just about abuse of power and the Catholic church manipulating people for money, but he got to a deeper theological issue. And it was the issue of justification by faith alone. that we are justified, that we're declared righteous. We can enter into heaven and be given eternal life on the, not on the basis of being righteous, but on the basis of receiving an external righteousness. I'll flesh that out more in a minute. Um, but this doctrine was so important to the reformers, not only Luther. He said... In it, the doctrine of justification by faith alone, all other articles of our faith are comprehended. And when that is safe, the others are safe too. Or later, this doctrine is the head and the cornerstone. It alone begets, nourishes, builds, preserves, and defends the church of God. And without it, the church of God cannot exist for one hour. Or Calvin said, Wherever the knowledge of it is taken away, the glory of Christ is extinguished. Religion abolished, the church destroyed, and the hope of salvation utterly overthrown. But, it doesn't really matter what they say if scripture itself doesn't put that emphasis on it, either explicitly or by implication. And I know we just finished Romans, and I'm bringing you back to Romans. It was four years of Romans. So hopefully this isn't too much new news to you. But the book of Romans hinges on this doctrine. In Paul's thought, justification by faith alone, was it? Crucial. If this is essential. This is gospel stuff. If you look at Romans, okay, you go to chapter 1, verse 18, after he finishes his introduction and expresses his desire to see them and expresses his desire to preach the gospel to them, you get to verse 18, and what does he say? Um, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And that kicks him off into chapter, through chapters 1, 2, first half of 3. He's laying out the wrath of God revealed against men and that no one is righteous, not even one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So he sets up, no one is righteous. The Gentiles, the non-Jews have fallen into depravity. The Jews, they have the law. They can't do anything to make themselves righteous in God's sight and be at peace with God. He sets it up and then he comes to three. And he turns, so we had Gentiles falling off. He says, okay, well, here's the law. Will the law save you? No, the, the Jews fall short. All fall short of the glory of God. We get to chapter three. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So there's a turning point. So two, or one, two, three, all building up to justification by faith. Three, that's our text, gives us this doctrine of justification by faith alone. Four, arguments supporting the doctrine of justification by faith alone. He says, this isn't a new thing. This was in Abraham, this was in David, this is through the whole Old Testament. Like he said, the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Five, implications of justification by faith alone. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
And he continues in five, he flushes some of that out. Uh, he gives some of the implications, he gives more reasoning for it. In six, he answers objections to it. Well, if, justification, if we're justified by faith, why not sin that grace may abound? If we're justified by faith, we're not under law, why not continue to sin? And so six through seven, he's explaining how that works. In eight, there is therefore now no condemnation, that therefore, linking back and you trace it, you come back to three, especially 21 through 28. What does this mean for the Jews? Nine, 10, and their relationship to God through history and their relationship to the church. And you get to 12, and he gets to application. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So five implications, six uh, refutation of uh, objections. Or, uh, yeah, six refutation of objections. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, all dealing with implications and refutations and objections to justification by faith. You get to twelve. What does he say? How are you going to live in light of justification by faith? The mercies of God. He says. And that's through the end of the book. So for Paul in the whole book of Romans, everything hinges on justification by faith. It's all just important for the reformers, but it's important for us as well. I mean, it is important for Paul. It was at the center of his theology. It's at the center of this exposition of the gospel and the fullest length exposition of it that we have from Paul. It's not something basic that we move on from. It's not tangential. It's not non-essential. But the church survives because we hold that we are justified by faith alone. And individual Christians, every one of us, has put our faith in Christ. We survive, we live life in the knowledge of this. We build our life on this. This is the foundation. Christ is the foundation. This is what links us to that. So what is it? So we'll start again in 320. We said, um, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. It says now uh, we are justified by faith. So to be justified, to be clear, means to be declared righteous. To be righteous means to have met a defined moral standard. And to be righteous in the sight of God means to have met God's moral standard. And to be justified means to, have, to be legally declared righteous. It does not mean to be righteous. Justification is tra- declarative, not transformative. So when it says that we are justified by faith, it doesn't mean he's making our substance, our nature, righteous. It's something credited to us. It's counted to us. Um, it's not that we are made righteous, that it's imparted. It's not imparted to us. All of a sudden, we are inherently righteous, but it is imputed. It's external. It's how God sees us. It's a legal, forensic declaration. It's our status, not our substance. And just to to really drive that home, we see that even God himself can be justified. It says in Romans chapter 3, he's quoting from Psalm 51 in verse 4. He says, Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified, that you, God, may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. And in Timothy, 1 Timothy, you go to chapter 2. Verse 16. Speaking of Christ, he says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He, Christ, was manifested in the flesh, vindicated or justified by the Spirit. So 
And so we see if justification was a matter of being made righteous, it couldn't be applied to God because God is righteous. You can't be made something that you already are. So to be justified simply means to declare. Or when people in Jesus' time, um, I'll skip that for now, but essentially it's a declared status. You can justify God and say God is righteous. It doesn't change anything about who God is of himself. And so it is the same with us. When we are justified, declared right before God, it means that we are declared righteous, regardless of the state in which we are in. So the question for us is, how can man be justified? As I already mentioned in the earlier parts of Romans, in 1, 2, and 3, Paul says that although man knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. If you go back to Genesis, God made man to bear his image. And you go here, by implication, God made man to honor God, to give thanks. And God made himself clearly manifest in the world from the beginning in the things that have been made. When you go out and you see a sunset and you see beauty, you're seeing evidence of the glory of God. It's clearly seen. Or in the mountains, or when you try and look into the far expanse of space and the billions of stars and planets and galaxies that are out there, it's the clear manifestation of the Creator. And by nature, we all reject it. It's all people baseline. And then you turn to the Jews, God's chosen people. He gives them the law, which is a manifestation of his righteousness. And you think we're trying to answer the question, how can man be in the right before God? And we would quickly jump to law. Well, be righteous. It says in Moses, um, those who do them shall live, or that he who lives by, or does them shall live by them. Sorry. Um, or if you do this, it will be righteousness for you. It says in Deuteronomy. But in Romans 2 and 3, Paul says that the Jews are no better off. He says, no, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And he says that the law is saying that to the Jews. The Jews think we have the law, we're the people of God. Surely we can be in the right before God. He says, the law itself says no one is righteous. So surely not you. For by works of the law, this is 320, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And in Galatians it says that if man could be righteous by any law, it'd be by this law. So we see here, it rules out man's ability to be in the right before God by anything of his own merit. 
if man could merit, if he could earn, he, he could deserve justification, God's righteous declaration over him and acceptance, it would be by this law. And Paul says it's insufficient. And not only the law, Paul says, but works in general. Some people will say, well, it's not by works of the Jewish law, the Mormons will say, but it's by some other kind of work, right? Or the Catholics, whatever it is. But then if you go to chapter four, he says, he goes from works of law of the Jews just to works. He says, what then shall we gain was, was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by our works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. And note that Abraham came before the Jewish law. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. And so Paul sets up this contrast. You can either be justified in God's sight by something you merit, right? Something that is your wage, that is your due, or by faith, as we see in the example of Abraham. And he's ruled out at this point justification by anything in us. And what is the alternative that he gives us in 3 23 and 24? He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So everybody's in this sinful state. Everybody is condemned. The wrath of God is revealed against all men. And are justified by his grace as a gift. So the contrast to works and what you merit and what is in yourself is grace. We're justified by his grace as a gift. And note, it doesn't say justified by faith there, and I'll loop back to that. But in this passage, it's essentially like Paul is kind of, in other places he says, you know, faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness, or we're justified by faith. In this passage, he's kind of pulling the cover off the machine and giving us the internal workings. How does that work? Because when he says we're justified by faith, he's kind of using a shorthand, or faith was counted to him as righteousness in Romans chapter four. It's kind of a shorthand. Um, way of saying this. And, and so he's, he's unpacking it here. How is it that we're justified by faith? By grace. And what does that mean? Well, as opposed to the works of the law and merit, it's a free gift. Grace is unmerited favor. Other translations say we're justified freely. We're justified freely. All the world is in a boat of condemnation headed for hell for their own sin and guilt that they've incurred in just condemnation and are incapable of pulling themselves out. And God will be just to send every one of them to hell. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and deserve it. And the only way out, like God reached in because he felt like it, because he's inclined to grace, because he's inclined to mercy, because he's inclined to save. And as a free gift, he offers us salvation. The God of the universe has made free justification, right standing in his sight. By no compulsion from the outside. Every person here who's in Christ, you were just snatched out of the fire. There's nothing in you and nothing in us that compels God by our own nature. We're rebels. We're enemies of God. It says we're dead in our sins. 
We're following the course of this world and the prince of the power of the air. And God, in his own free grace, reaches in and saves us. How? Does he just dismiss our sin and write it off? No, it's not pardon. It's not pardon where he just comes and he says, yeah, not such a big deal. You know, I'll just kind of forget about it, throw over my shoulder. That's an unjust God, for one. How does he do it? In 24, he says, by his grace as a gift, through, here's the means by which he redeems us in his grace. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption, some translations, it's ransom. The idea is um, freedom or restoration bought at a price. So there's a contrast, freely by his grace, but not free for God. Free for the transgressor, infinitely costly for the maker. The redemption that is in Christ. So God didn't just write our sins off. He paid the price. He took the wrath. God saved us from the wrath of God. And how? In Christ Jesus. God did not stand aloof from us in the midst of our sin. He does not look at the human condition and look at us with scorn and leave us to our own devices and walk away. Rather, the Father gives up his only son. And the son lays down his own life in his love for the father. The father pours out his wrath on the son and the son endures the wrath, the infinite wrath of his own father. what it means in the next verse whom God put forward put forward as a propitiation by his blood propitiation is a sacrifice to satisfy wrath So we are justified, declared righteous, freely by God's grace. Through Christ, who came, he lived, he died, he was raised up after three days and justified. That's what it says in 1 Timothy. Christ was justified in being raised. Ascended to the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us now. Those are the inner workings of grace and the divine plan to save sinners. But still we know that not all go to heaven. And what's the difference? What's the difference for us who are sitting here who are headed for heaven and the billions who are headed for hell? It's just faith. To be clear, it's not something in our nature. It's not something that we merit. He says, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Already Paul has ruled out 
merit. And you get to chapter four, he rules out, chapter four, he rules out merit. So we receive it by faith. And what is faith? Faith is passive, receiving, is trusting. By definition, it cannot be a work. Otherwise, it's, a, it's meriting, it's earning salvation. It's something, doing something to deserve it. People who go to heaven go to heaven because they trust in Christ, not themselves. A couple of clarifications. To say that faith plus works saves us is to say the cross was insufficient. Again, that's to merit. Christ got us so far, but we still must merit something. We must earn it. And to say that faith is righteousness, and this is important, it's not that God says, okay, they can't meet the demands of the law, so I'll just lower the bar. And it's just faith now. If you have faith, that's good enough. You know, that is your righteousness. It's not that faith is righteousness. Because that's to say that the cross was unnecessary. In that case, God can change the standard of righteousness and there's no need for a sacrifice. There's no need for a propitiation. There's no need for the Son of God to lay his life down. But to be justified by faith means to be justified on the basis of something that is outside of ourselves, not in ourselves. It's to be justified on the basis of Christ's righteousness. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Or in Romans 6, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For we, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So the way that this works is faith unites us to Christ. It unites us to him in his death. It unites us to him in his resurrection and his vindication. So when Christ was justified, vindicated in the resurrection, those who are in Christ Jesus were vindicated in him. So in a sense, you were justified 2,000 years ago, before you were born. And in a sense, you died 2,000 years ago, before you were born in Christ. And so in the end, it is God's righteousness that saves us. And so God can declare us righteous because we're united to Christ. In Ephesians 5, he talks about how marriage is a picture of the church and of Christ. And there's such a union there in this case that Christ's righteousness is credited to us because we are joined to him. And our sin was credited to him because we are joined to him. And he took on the condemnation that we deserve because we're joined to him. We're his bride. And he gives us all the blessings. And that's why Paul says, the ungodly, their union with Christ in his perfect life, his death, his resurrection. So that we are not inherently righteous. God may be just in justifying us. That's why he might be just. He doesn't 
relinquish the demand for righteousness and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so then, in this whole passage, Romans 3, let's say 22 through 26, it makes very explicit. All of the plan of salvation and the salvation of individuals and the salvation of the church is focused on God. It is God's plan to justify sinners by God's grace through God's son laying down his own life bearing God's wrath to show God's righteousness And we see that the gospel is fundamentally about God. Which is an assurance. Because it's God justifying sinners for the sake of his own glory. It's God justifying sinners for the sake of his own righteousness. It sent his son for the sake of his own vindication. And we're just caught up in it. God has this divine eternal plan for, his own, for the sake of his own name with which he is chiefly concerned above everything. And we get to be the passive benefactors. And that's our security, is that it's all God and his concern for God. It's the son's concern for the father and the father's love for the son. And we're just caught up in it. God saving sinners from God by God. But we still have to ask, why, why did you know, the reformers see it as so important? Why did Paul see it as so important? Why is the doctrine of justification by faith so important? Essentially, it just is foundational in shaping of every aspect of not only the Christian life, but of life. If you don't get this, if you don't, not the doctrine of justification by faith, but the idea that you cannot be saved by your own righteousness and that you need Christ's righteousness, you're lost. So if you're sitting here and you don't have peace with God, you don't know God, and you're convicted for your sin, Don't try and earn God's favor, but trust in Christ. Christ laid down his life so that anybody who comes to him by faith will be saved. Furthermore, and going back to Romans 5 and the implications of justification by faith, He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think it's possible for Christians, and I know myself, to live a life of anxiety because they're not resting on this. And Christ's righteousness. Um, but to wake up and feel guilty in the morning or when you go to bed at night. Or no matter how much you feel convicted when you sin, you can't get free of the burden of it. And you feel like you're constantly trying to scrub your conscience clean. You can't move on to the next thing because you feel 
burdened with guilt? Are you anxious about making a bad decision and losing God's favor? Uh, what if I end up going to the wrong school or marrying the wrong person or going to the wrong church? Or you're just constantly afraid of messing up. Or you think you've sinned and God's displeased with you. And you've got to be far off for a little bit. And you just keep falling a deeper and deeper sin because you feel distant from God. All of that is answered in Romans 5, verse 1, on the basis of Romans 3, verses 23, 24, 25. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Isaiah, verse 26, a little past uh, what Jason read this morning, kind of flowing from it. It says, the Lord will ordain peace for us, for he has indeed done for us all our works. So the Christian life now is one of just peace with God. Because he's done our works. Christ has done it. He satisfied the demands of righteousness and of punishment. Who is to condemn, Paul says? Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who's at the right hand of the Father? Who indeed is interceding for us day in, day out, 24-7. Christ at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf, not on the basis of our righteousness, not on the substance of what we are. I was saying, no, they're not that bad. Just give them a little more time. No. But on the basis of his own righteousness, which is perfect. He intercedes for us. In Romans 5, second one, implication of it, through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So through Christ, having been justified, we've obtained access into this grace in which we stand and our hope of heaven is secure. So just like we don't have to be concerned about God's displeasure in the moment, we don't have to be concerned about God's displeasure eternally. We rejoice in hope in the glory of God. In that text, he's grounding our hope in justification by faith. We know that we will enter into the, the presence of God at whose right hand there are pleasures forevermore because of what Christ has done for us. Because we are legally declared righteous. We're acquitted on the basis of our union with Christ through faith. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. In Romans 8.28, 
Paul gives us one of the greatest promises, I think, in the whole Bible, when he says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. He's saying all things, and in Romans 5, all sufferings are working together for the good of God's people. And we would be confident of that because of our standing in Christ. And then Paul knows that there are some who are hearing this who will be tempted to say, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, logically, there's a difference between saying that logically. Like, well, if we're uh, justified freely, it doesn't matter what we've done, but what he's done, then it doesn't matter what we do. Let's go sin. And if you think that way, logically, uh, that's understandable. But if you see that as a, oh, great, I have an excuse to go do all the sin that I want to do, Paul says there's something fundamentally wrong. In chapter 6, he says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So he's saying those who have faith in Christ have died to sin. It means you're not held by it anymore and you don't live for it anymore. And so if your first response when you hear this is, great, I'm going to go start sinning, it indicates you haven't died to it. It's Paul's argument. Furthermore, there could be no disregard in light of this for the way that the rest of your life looks. Because the faith that rests in Christ is a living faith, James says. Um, he says in James chapter 2, verses 14 and 18, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Or in 18, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And again, not saying those works earn us anything before God, but if those works aren't there, they're a sign that the faith isn't there, because the faith is a living and active faith. to I guess, begin to wrap things up. What does it mean for this doctrine that we are justified by faith alone, that it's Christ's righteousness that justifies us before God? What does it mean that, that ought to be a defining feature of our lives and a key doctrine? I think one of the biggest things is to note that the Christian life is not about rule following. It's not about figuring out what to eat or what to drink or what to wear. It's not figuring out the order of the service or all the particulars about parenting and raising kids. Figuring out exactly how to use every dollar you get. Now, don't get me wrong, I think there's intentionality that God calls us to and a desire for righteousness. But our main focus is not, how do I do this? How do I do that? What are we supposed to do for this? The chief concern of the Christian and the church, as Pastor Ken puts it, is to stare your eyes out at Jesus Christ. 
And as Luther said, wherefore it ought to be the first concern of every Christian to lay aside all confidence in works and grow in the knowledge not of works, but of Christ Jesus, who suffered and rose for him. So the question is, is your life focused on Christ himself? Is your Christianity about Christ? Or is it focused on doing? Is it focused on the, you know, the, the temporal unit of Southside Bible Church? Or is it focused on just um, the ideal family? or the ideal kids, or, or the most godly way to do this or that? Or is it focused on Christ himself and his righteousness? That is the chief concern, and everything follows it. Is your conversation consumed with Christ? Or righteous deeds? Are your thoughts consumed with Christ? Or with systems? Systems or just disconnected uh, doctrines and rules, uh, trends. But chiefly this religion, this faith is about Christ and resting in him for our salvation and our standing before God and living in Christ. It starts right there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning again. Thank you for your grace. Lord, thank you for laying down your life for us that we might be reconciled to God and be given the greatest gift that we could ever be given. And that is you. God, thank you for reconciling us to yourself and giving us you for all of eternity and fullness of joy. God, please help us live in Christ, look to Christ, run to Christ, think of Christ, speak of Christ, rest in Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.